Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. We'll get there in just one second. We are in a five-week series called The People of the Way or Way People. And one of the things that we want to do in this church is that as we preach God's Word to you, we also want to make sure that you understand that your faith is connected to something that is far older than you and I. It's one of the reasons that we sing hymns in this church. Anyone love the hymns? Anyone like me love hymns? One of the reasons we do that is because hymns remind us that we're connected to a greater faith, an ancient faith. So listen, I don't know, I don't know if we'll be singing Reckless Love in 300 years. I have no idea. But I know the church has sang Come Thou Fount through pandemics. They've sung Come Thou Fount through government changes. They've sung Come Thou Fount when the economy has dropped. And so we sing these songs and we want to be a people of history who live in the tension of Christian history, which is, which is often not beautiful and, and painful at times, but we live in that history and we learn from it and we learn from the scriptures. And so for the first five years of the Christian faith, the people of God were not called Christians. They were called people of the way or way people. Not because they lived by a particular doctrine or dogma or they believed by a particular uh, set of actions, but more so they lived a way of life that reflected the person of Jesus. And for many people in, in these first five centuries, it was both confusing to them as well as attractive. They were attracted to this way of life because Christians seem to experience something transformative in them, especially in a culture that was chaotic. It was attractive to many people because the people of the way were this diverse group of people. Christianity at the time was different. People were then homogenous people. They, they only hung out and they lived with people like them. So the, the Greeks were with the Greeks and the Romans were with the Romans. So the pagans were with the pagans, the Gentiles were with the Gentiles, the Jews were with the Jews. And now here comes this new sect of people that are totally different and they were inclusive, not necessarily in, or not particularly in theology, but they were inclusive socially. So you would walk into a group of people as the way, as the church, and you would see every ethnicity, tribe and tongue gathering. And this was attractive to the people. And, and what was really attractive was the way of the people uh, of Jesus seemed to have the, the answer of how to restore dignity to the poor and to women and children. And so what we want to do in, in 2021 is learn what it means to be the people of God. Because when you say the word Christian, well, that can mean a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people. Can I get an amen on that? Listen, I'm coming out of the gate hot this year. I'm coming fired up. I don't even know if I have any 90s references, but if I bring it up, I almost wore my Bayside t-shirt today, but I didn't because it was in the wash. But you guys need to be with me today, okay? All right, the first, the first gathering, I was so distracted because my kids were in here. My kids were walking by. This kid's chewing on a water bottle over here. It's throwing me off, but we're back now. We're focused and we are back. I don't know where I was, but I'm gonna get back to it. Oh yeah. So Barna did a recent survey that found that the vast majority of Americans would claim Christian. They, they would check the box, Christian. But the same study found that of those vast majority of Americans who call themselves Christians, they have never in their life actually confessed or professed that Jesus Christ is Lord of their life and has saved them from their sins. So when we say that everyone's a Christian or we say the word Christian, you can see why we get a plethora of answers of what it means to be Christian. And what I want to show you from the text today is that the central essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is something called love that we are a people who have been loved by God and we are a people who love as Jesus. But here's the thing, we don't get to define what this love is because culture has taken that and the culture has made it to be all kinds of things. Love is emotive and love is all about feelings and scripture has something else to say about love. But before, before we go on, I just need to pause for one second and address something that is happening in culture today that does affect the life of this church and our body. We are, and we are aiming to continually be a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church. And here's what this means. Thank you. I don't know who that was, but okay. Me and, me and the one other immigrant in the room are just clapping. Just going around. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. I am in an interracial marriage. Or, in, or, or an inter-ethnic marriage. And my wife and I joke about this. 
my life would be, um, Chad, you can start the clock, man. I'm gonna just keep going. You can start the clock. Otherwise, you know, you know, y'all know brown pastors. We say I'm wrapping up, but we mean you were just taking off. So <laughs> I'm in an inter-ethnic marriage. And we joke about this. My life would be a lot easier if I married someone who, who lived in India, who was Indian and lived in, their, in India half their life and then moved to America for the second half of their life. My, my life would be a lot easier in many ways. And my wife's life would be a lot easier if she married a white dude from Mundelein, Illinois, which is like the hood of the nice suburbs, and she, her life would be easier. But our aim is not to have an easy life. Our life is adventurous and it's beautiful, but we don't always think the same. We don't always act the same. We don't talk the same. We have two very different native languages, which my wife gets very upset at when my brother and I joke around in our native language and we're not even saying anything. We're just laughing on purpose and she gets pretty upset at us. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? We'll just say stuff like, I know, just, and and then she'd be like, what are you guys saying? And we just look at her. <laughs> it's always funny when someone's like, can you talk Indian? Like, uh, there's 400 languages. Which one would you like me to pick, you know? <laughs> but here's what we need to address. To, to be, listen, our church, if we were a homogenous church and we all voted the same and we all dressed the same and talked the same, there would be some issues we wouldn't need to talk about. But we are a multi-ethnic church, which means that people in this room vote different. They eat different. They speak different, we talk different, but our commonality is that we are all saved by the grace of Jesus who has, who has broken down the dividing wall of hostility between us and creating in us one body that doesn't reflect America, but that reflects the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? And so I wanna, I wanna just address really briefly the events that happened on January 6th. And I believe it was Karl Barth who said, when you preach, you should preach with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. And so here's what I want you to know. As an immigrant to this country, which means I have an experience like several others that most of you don't have. Most of you have never had to stand in line for days and days and days on Jackson Street waiting for some immigration officer to let you stay in this country. You've never had to do that. You were born in this country, and listen, I tell my kids, you hit the jackpot. And I understand, being an immigrant, I love America. My wife is American, my kids are American, my family's American. I love this country. I love what God is doing in this country, as he's doing all over the world. I, I see the opportunities I have here that I would not otherwise have in other parts of the world. But I also see that though this country was, was shaped by some ideals, those ideals are fundamentally flawed and broken because we are flawed and sinful people. And so as the people of God, what does this mean for us? It means that as the people of God, we condemn violence of any kind. We condemn any mob violence of any kind. It is a sin that must be repented of. We also recognize that on January 6th, four people died four people lost their lives. It grieves the heart of God. It should grieve us. It doesn't matter if they voted the same as you or different. It should grieve us that four people made in the image of God no longer exist on this side of eternity. And so what it means for us as a church is we also don't make vague and blanket statements. We don't say, oh, they all are like this and they all deserve this. No, listen, I know people who were there who love Jesus and who love this country and who want to be and desire to be people of truth and grace, and they are peacemakers. So we don't just lump, put everyone into one category. That's not what the people of God do. The people of God don't fight for power. The people of Jesus actually do what Jesus did and gave up power. This is what we do in order that we might win people over, not to our party and not even to our church, to win them over to the cause of Christ and the love of God that exists for them. And so my prayer is that we become this kind of church. And what I want to talk to you about today is how we become that church is by being a people who love, genuine love. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. I'm going to read 9 through 21, and we're going to unpack it. So can we do that? 9 through 21. I'm going to end it by saying, this is the word of the Lord, to which you will say, that's right. I will say, this is the word of the Lord, and you will say, thanks be to God. Romans chapter 12, beginning of verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. 
Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You almost can see Jesus just saying that, can't you? It just sounds like something Jesus would say. People ask me all the time, what of all my mom makes, what my favorite food is. Like, what's your mom's favorite, your mom makes food. Listen, my mom, my mom can cook, y'all. I I know you think your mom can cook. My mom can cook, okay? My mom's watching right now and she's typing, amen. She knows, she knows she can cook. (laughs) Listen, I have seen seen miracles when my mom has cooked. I have seen marriages restored, y'all. I have, seen, I have seen global leaders signing peace treaties over, over a plate of lemon rice and chicken curry. I have seen and heard, well, I haven't seen them, but I've, I've heard of stories of children being conceived the night after they ate some of my mom's. I mean, I'm telling you, she can cook. And when people ask me, people ask me about my mom's food. What they're not doing, watch this, watch this. What they're not doing is asking me to give a prescription. They're not asking me, hey, tell me all the information of what your mom makes. They're not saying, hey, tell me what size of the chicken does she use and and how does she cut it and how long does she make it? They're not asking for information. What they're asking for is a description. They're saying, describe to me how your mom makes this food. How does it make you feel? What does it take you back to? What does it invoke in you? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? Have you thought about this before? You are rarely, if ever moved, by prescriptions. You have never really been moved by someone just telling you basic information. You're moved when someone describes the essence of something to you. We do this with our food. We do this with, with our hiking. We, we describe the, the mountains we go hiking. We describe nature. Now, now y'all know I don't do this, but y'all do this. You, you describe the, the 14er you went on and what it looked like and, and what it smelled like and, and what it tasted like and, and all the emotions that came out of you. We do this with love, don't we? When you fall in love with someone, everyone just fallen in love before? You fallen in love? Four of us have fallen in love. Man, <laughs> some of you guys are engaged. I'm doing your wedding. I hope you put your hand up. And when you describe someone you love, are you giving them information? Like, hey, tell me, tell me about the person you love. Oh yeah, man, yeah, she's, she's five foot seven. Um, she, she has long brown hair. She was born on August 25th. And she has 14 freckles. And I think she got a 32 on her ACT. Is that, is that how you would describe somebody? No, it's not how you do it, right? You're like, oh man. Oh man, she is gorgeous. She is beautiful. She loves Jesus. She, and you're just describing everything you can. And when, when I was coming up, you had one word. If there was a girl that you were in love with, you had one word to describe that girl. You know what it was? Want me to tell you? It was like, man, she's so cool. That was the word. It was like, man, she, she is so cool. You tell your friends, man, this girl is so cool. Because we're moved by descriptions, aren't we? And the challenge with the Christian life, though, is this. Watch this. We often want God to give us constant prescriptions of what to do. So we say, God, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do in this situation, at this time, when I'm at this age, in this place in life. Tell me all the things to do. Prescribe to me my faith. The challenge is our faith, especially in the scriptures, is not something that's prescribed. It's something that's described. The scriptures are describing the kind of life you can have when you encounter the living God. It describes the richness of someone who lives in the fulfillment of God's joy. 
We want our lives to be descriptive, not prescriptive. Because the problem is there's so many situations. I don't know what the Christian thing is to do. Can I get a witness? Am I the only one? You don't know what the Christian thing is to do. So you could do, listen, listen, watch. You could do the Christian thing without ever having a Christ-like heart. You could do the Christian task without ever having the transformed nature of the Holy Spirit inside of you. And we see this in culture. I, I remember one time, my, one of my best friends in the world, my best friend, Steve and I went to the mall. We went, we went to Northbrook Mall. Steve, you're watching right now. Steve, you know this is true. We went to Northbrook Mall and Steve went in the mall with no bracelet, but he walked out of the mall with a WWJD bracelet on. And I was like, where did you get that? He's like, oh, I stole it. And I'm like, let me get this straight. You stole a WWJD bracelet? Listen, I'm no, I'm no expert or anything, but I'm just going to go ahead. You know, no, actually, I'm gonna, I, I don't think Jesus would steal a what would Jesus do bracelet. Am I the, I, just don't, I, just don't, I just don't think he would walk into Claire's and then walk out with something that he didn't pay for. I just, and, and the problem is, uh, the problem is, I don't know what Jesus would do. You ever have a situation in your life and, and you call your one Christian friend, the one Christian friend you'll never call ever again? You know, man, I'm a real dilemma. I don't know what to do. And your friend says, well, what would Jesus do? Well, what would the Lord do? I don't know. I don't know what he would do. Would Jesus go to homecoming with Stacy or Stephanie? I don't know which one he would do. I don't know. Would Jesus, given the option, buy a Honda or a Tesla? I don't know. Now, if Jesus was Indian, I know he's definitely buying the Honda. That's for sure. <laughs> for sure. Listen, I could call my dad right now. I could call my dad right now and say, dad, you won't believe it. I bought a brand new 2021 Tesla. My dad would be like, why? I saw a 2002 Honda Civic outside. You should just buy that one. Listen, Jesus is Indian. I know exactly what he's buying. I know exactly what he's doing. But for the most part in life, listen, I don't know what Jesus would do. Would Jesus take this job or this job? Would he go to this movie or this movie? Would he, would he marry this person or this person? I don't know what Jesus would do. So how then do we function or operate as Christians we remember that the scriptures and the scriptures today are describing to us the kind of life you should live. So when someone describes your life as a follower of Jesus, it should be the description of someone who is deeply in love with God and that love exudes from them and is expressed into the world. But the catch is we don't get to define what that love is. We don't. Paul shows us what this is. Now, I want you to notice a couple things in the text. If you, if you read verse 9 through 21, you're going to notice three things, or at least I hope you notice three things. And if not, that's why I'm here. My job is to help you notice things that, that you didn't notice. And, and you notice this thing that says, okay, these are the marks of a true Christian, right? Anyone else see it? You have that in your Bible? Marks of a true Christian. So Paul didn't put that in. Someone else put that in later. But if these are the marks of the Christian, Christian, I'm asking myself, and you should be asking yourself, if this is what it means to be a Christian, where is confession? Where is repentance? Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is turning from, um, from darkness and, and turning to light? Where is the church? Where is baptism? All of this is missing. Does anyone else notice this? Am I the only one who notices? A lot of stuff is missing. Okay, rhetorical question. We'll just keep going. <laughs> it's missing because the implication is this. Paul is writing to people who are already believers. They're already believers. What does it mean to be a believer? What does it mean to be a Christian? A Christian or a person of the way is someone who believes that the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ has come to establish the rule and the reign of his kingdom. And because we are sinful, we cannot experience that kingdom until we have repented of our sins and Jesus takes our place and transfers us into his kingdom when we repent from our ways. So we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. We believe in our heart. Upon that moment of believing what Jesus has done for us on the cross, we receive immediately the forgiveness of God. We are made into new creations. We are filled with the spirit of God who now leads us into a life of freedom, free to not sin, free to live in his power, to deny his flesh and walk in the fulfillment of who he is in order that we might continually and eternally be formed into the person of Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. So Paul's saying, since you already know that, I'm gonna leave this part out. 
Now, because you are a Christian, how must you live? I want you to notice two more things. Number one is this, or number two is this. Verse 10 through 21 are the details of the description of the Christian life. They're the details, the, the, the details of the new standard by which you and I are called to. If you are a follower of Jesus, listen to me, you are called by God to live with a new standard. A new creation has a new standard. And the standard is set by God. And the details are in 10 through 21. We'll unpack that in the weeks ahead. But where do these details come from? It all comes from verse 9. Verse 9 is where the description is derived. It's the source. Touch your neighbor and say, I found the source. Say it louder. I found the source. The source of how one should live is in love. We are to be a people who live and love. Notice what Paul says. Paul says, let love be genuine. Paul does not say Christians do loving things. Christians say loving things. He doesn't even say Christians be loving. He says, let love be. In other words, Paul is saying the Christian life is not what you do that's loving, but it's in allowing God to let you become someone who is loving. The Christian life is not what you do, it's who you become. We become loving like Jesus. And that happens not when we control the process, but when we enter the process with the Spirit and let love have its way. Let love do the work. Let love have its way in your life. This is what Paul is telling us, which means, write this down, the central mark of the Christian life is love. The central mark of the Christian life is love. We live in a world where Christianity is marked by a lot of things. If you're driving, it's marked by that little fish sticker in some back of people's car. You know, like, shows them that they're a Christian, little fish. It's marked by our fashion. Now, now today, we, we got some cooler fashion. Back when I was growing up, the Christian fashion wasn't as cool. Any, anyone know, anyone still got your Lord's Gym t-shirt? You're not proud of it, but you still got it? Remember that, the Lord's Gym? You have a Lord's Gym with some, like, really buff dude on there, and it would say, I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I wore that to the gym and I realized that's not true. I, I can't, I can't, I can't squat 300 pounds even with, even with my cool Jesus t-shirt. I just can't do it. We got these things that kind of tell people we're Christians. You walk in our homes and, and, and the cross, which once was a symbol for the early church of persecution, is now sort of just home decor for us. We have a cool little cross. We, we bought it at Hobby Lobby because everything's always 50% off at Hobby Lobby. And so we, we got it there. And, and we got these cool coffee mugs that, that have verses on it that have nothing to do with the actual context. You know, like, man, do you, do you love my, do you just love my as the deer panted for water cup? It's just so good. Like, there's no context whatsoever, you know? I've never seen, I've just never seen a coffee cup that's like a bore evil. I've just never seen that one in my life, you know? <laughs> You know, it's always like, as the deer panted for the water, so my soul pants for this coffee, like well, this stuff. And, and so we kind of had this, our, our, our Christian thing. But, but comprehensively, there's some attitudes that people believe reflect the Christian character. Today, if you would just do a poll and you said, what do you think about Christians? You would get a whole lot of things. You would get, man, Christians are judgmental. They're, they're marked by condemnation. One of my favorites that people say is Christians are anti-science. Like, okay, like, I think God invented science, but apparently Christians are anti-science. We're anti-diversity. We're anti-inclusivity. We're condemning and we're judgmental. We're intellectual imbeciles. I'm literally, there's people who believe there's no Christian who, who is remotely smart. They're just all idiots. Uh, we, we are, we're condemning, we're controlling we're political, we're partisan. I mean, this, this, if, you just, if you just went in the streets and asked people, what do you think of the word Christian? I guarantee you though, some of the answers. You would get some of those. Yet, Paul says, the central mark of a Christian should be love. Here's the catch. Love does not make you a Christian. Your confession of faith in Jesus Christ as a savior of your life, that's what makes you a Christian. But love identifies you as one. It lets the world see. It lets others around you see whether this person is a believer in Jesus or not. It identifies you and I as followers of Jesus. Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. 
is the identifying mark of people of the way. It is what brings us our essence. Our essence is that we are a loving people. We love God and love others. I love the words of the great Francis Schaeffer. He says this. He says, love is a universal mark that is to last through all ages of the church till Jesus comes back. Love. Well, what is this love? The word that Paul uses here, English, English is such a flat language. There's only one way to say something. There's just one way. Like, so love means sort of just that one word. But in Greek, there's multiple ways to say love. The Bible predominantly uses the word love in three or four different words. This particular word, love, is the word agape. Now, what's beautiful about agape is agape is not an emotion. Agape is not even a verb. Agape describes God. According to the Apostle John, John says God is love. God is agape. God is a supernatural, divine, perfect, unbroken love. And this agape love reflects the love that God has for himself. We believe in one God who exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is so deeply agape in love with God the Son, and God the Son is so deeply agape with God the Spirit, and God the Spirit is so deeply agape with God the Father. And from that love and through that love, you and I came to exist. We were created by the genuine agape love of God. It's the same love that God loves the world with. In John 3, 16, for God so agape the world that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. God agapes you. And the word agape means this. It's very simple. The way God loves you is this. Agape love always seeks the highest good. God loves you in a way where he is seeking your highest good for always. And this word agape in Greek, in ancient Greek literature was rarely, if ever, used. And it was used by the church to describe two things. The early people of the way, the early followers of Jesus used the word agape love to describe, watch this, what they experienced of how God loved them in his grace. See, we were, we were agaped by God. God seeks our highest good. Could you, could you say that? Could you say, honestly, I love God because he seeks my highest good? And they would use the same word to describe the quality of love with which they were to love others. In other words, because they have experienced the agape love of Jesus, they were now called to express that agape love of Jesus, which means this, way people are loved by Jesus and love as Jesus. Before you can love as Jesus, you must first believe and live in the love of Jesus. You know and believe that Jesus loves you. In other words, the love of Jesus has rescued you and restored you when you were fallen and broken and far from God. When you were far away from God, God looked down into the depths of who you are and he did not reject you. He did not cast you aside. He did not say, I'm gonna find something better. He did not say, why don't you clean up a little bit and come back to me, maybe we, maybe we can work something out. God finds you at your worst and he delivers in you his best, his absolute best love. And because this love is now in you, this love begins to restore you and bring you back into whom God has called you to be a son and a daughter of Jesus, living in the inheritance and the power and the promise of God. Now, the, the crazy thing is how much culture has stolen this message. I mean, basically what I described is every Disney movie. Every Di Disney had, has made billions off of this idea. Millions and billions off of the idea that you were once so far gone, living in your past, destructive and fallen into a curse. And what will rescue you is what? Love. Love will turn it around. Love will bring you back home. Love will restore you. Love will redeem you. Love will release you. We've, we've believed this story in culture. It's just hard for us to believe in reality with the gospel, but this is the story of the gospel that culture has taken. It's in every movie. He's holding back. He's hiding. 
But what I can't decide, why won't he be the king I know he is, the king I see in? And can you feel the love tonight? It is where we are. It's enough to make kings and vagabonds. I just love the way he says that, vagabond. <laughs> right, it's, 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 it's the Lion King. If Nala can just convince Simba how much she loves him, he will discover that he's not the result of his past, but he will ascend into his glorious future to defeat Scar, the wicked enemy, and then be the king. It's the story of Beauty and the Beast, which is also the hashtag for my wife and I's wedding. <laughs> it's the story of a prince who is cursed and he's living in darkness. And, and in this final moment, before the last petal falls, what does he have to experience? True love. This is the story of the gospel, but to a far greater degree. You and I, are painfully broken and far from God. And it doesn't matter how much success you hide behind. It doesn't matter how much culture you hide behind. It doesn't matter how much education you have. You know deep down in your soul, you are painfully lost without God. And you know this because every morning you wake up trying to muster up another sense of purpose, another sense of identity. Maybe one more relationship will be the one. And in that moment, there's a gentle reminder from the Spirit of God that tells you you are loved by God. And I get it. Some of you in this room right now don't feel loved by God. You think you've gone too far, said too much, done too much. But I want to remind you of the scriptures that say there is nothing in all of heaven, in all of the earth, in all of the universe, in all of the galaxy that can separate you from the love of God. And this love of God was displayed for you on the cross of Jesus. He displays his mercy and his grace to rescue you, to redeem you, and to restore you. I love the words of Tim Keller. He says, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared to imagine. And yet, at the same time, we are more loved and welcomed than we ever dared to hope. You are loved by God. And because you are loved by God, you are now released in that love to love the world. This is Paul saying in Ephesians chapter five, verse one, be imitators of God just as Christ has loved you. You go love. You are released into the world to love. And how do we love? It's not a love that is personal. It's not a love that is defined by me or by us or by culture. Paul says, let love be Genuine. If you have a Bible, and I hope you have a Bible, circle that word genuine. Genuine, that word means sincere with no pretense. In fact, the exact Greek word for genuine is without hypocrisy. That word was used in Greek culture to describe actors who wore a mask and they hid behind secret agendas. And Paul says, your love should be without hypocrisy. You should seek the highest good of everyone around you with no hypocrisy because God loves you with no hypocrisy. You should love others with no hypocrisy. Now, how do we do this in a world where, if we can be honest, Christians are defined by one word, hypocrites. That's what we're called, are we not? Am I, am I the only one that gets called that? Am I the only one gets messages on Facebook? Tell me, am I the only one? Am I the only one get thumbs down on YouTube videos? Am I the only one? We're called hypocrites. How do we love hypocritically? When we look out for ourselves. How do we love in a way that's not hypocritical, but genuine? I, I would identify three ways for you today. How do we love in a way with no hypocrisy? Genuine, God-honoring, God-pleasing love. Number one is this. You cannot love if you're desperate to be liked. That's hypocritical. So part of the problem with Christians, can I be honest? Can I be honest with you? Because you all know I love being honest. Can we be honest? Part of the problems with Christians is we're so desperate to be liked by everyone, which means we can't actually love anyone. If you are so desperate to be liked by everyone around you, you cannot be loving towards them. There are days in my life, most days, where my three children do not like me or my, my wife. And our aim as parents is not to raise children to like us. Because we love them, we have to speak truth to them. Because we love them, there's discipline. Because we love them, there's correction. Because we love them, we speak to them in certain ways. And you know as well as I do, I guarantee this is true, there are some people in your life that you will not love. You'll hide behind the word, 
you'll justify a, a, a reinterpretation of that word, but you hide behind it and you will not love them because you're desperate for them to like you. You're desperate for them to not unfollow you. And because you're so desperate to be liked, your love is actually hypocritical. Secondly, to love, hip, to love without hypocrisy means that you love someone without ever needing something from them. Listen, you cannot love anyone, including your children or your spouse, if you need something from them. You know that old line, you complete me? It sounds so good, doesn't it? You complete me? That would be a terrible marriage. If you're constantly looking for this person to complete you, you need something from this person, which means you can't fully love them as God intended for them to be loved because you need them to stay in your life. You need them. And this is the beauty of the gospel. God doesn't need you or I. It doesn't complete him. Rather, God invites us to be with him because it completes us. It brings us into purpose, us into identity, us into destiny. You cannot love anyone if you're desperate for them to do something for you. Ask yourself in the room right now. Ask yourself watching online. Are the people in your life, do you need something from them? And thirdly is this. You cannot love anyone if you are constantly demanding your rights and your preferences. That is not love. Love does not demand my rights, my way, my preferences. Love, as Jesus did, was giving up his rights. An innocent man crucified on the cross for you and I. Greater love is this than you would lay down your life for your friend. Love is when I give up my way, when I give up my rights, when I give up my privilege, when I give up my preferences for others. That's love. That's how you love with no hypocrisy. That's the kind of love that believers are called to. And the way this looks is really more unpacked in verse 9. To love without hypocrisy, genuine love is to abhor evil. In fact, the word Paul uses there is hate. If, you love, if your love is genuine, you should hate what is evil. It should be an anathema to believers. And what is evil? Evil is any activity on this earth that fundamentally pleases me and those like me. Paul says, run from it. Run from anything that pleases you over pleasing God. And instead, hold fast, which is the same word Paul uses in marriage, cling. May a husband and wife hold fast, cling to one another, cling to all that is good, all that is right in the eyes of God as defined by God, all that is pleasing and honoring to God. More often than not, I get questions all the time in my office. People call me, email me, come step by, and they'll say, hey, hey, pastor, I have a decision to make. Should I do this or this or, and they'll always ask me, is this a sin? They want to know, is this a sin? And many times the answer is pretty blatant, like, yeah, man, I, I, I don't think you should engage in that. But sometimes it's far more difficult is it a sin to do this? Is it a sin to watch this? Is it a sin to be in a relationship with this person? And my question to them is always this. Stop asking if it's a sin and ask the deeper question. Is what I'm about to do, is what I'm about to think or act or use my body for or my time or my money honoring to God? Is what I'm about to do pleasing to God? And more often than not, you get a very clear answer. Now you might push against it, you might run from it, but you get a very clear answer. Listen to me, followers of Jesus in this room, those watching online, you know. I don't have to tell you, you know, you know there are some things in your life that you should not be engaged in. You know there are some things you are doing with your body to the people that you love. There are some things that you engaged couples are doing that you know, you know is not right in the eyes of God. You know it is not God's standard and does not please God. You know when you open up your laptop and you're looking at certain things, you know it's not pleasing to God. You know the way you spend your time and your money and your worship and your home and your eyes and what you laugh at, you know it's not pleasing to God. And for followers of Jesus, listen to me, this simply cannot be. Now it doesn't mean, listen to me, hear me very clearly. It does not mean that God loves you less or that if you do certain things, God loves you more. 
What it means is because God unconditionally loves you, he wants you to change and be transformed. See, I thought my entire life, I thought my entire life, the scariest thing in the world was to love someone unconditionally. I did. When I first got married, my amazing wife here, I thought, man, I have to love this woman forever. Like, for, like forever, ever, forever, ever, ever, forever. So I was going to get you with a reference. I got you. I got you. Forever, ever, forever, ever, ever. And I was like, Lord, like, I got I to gotta love her unconditionally. Lord, she can't even cook. But I got to love her unconditionally. <laughs> Lord, Lord what, 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 if she, what if she thinks the way you budget is to spend more than you make? Lord, what if, she, what if she's like, like, like she just like has clutter everywhere? What, what, what if she doesn't cook like my mom? I'm supposed to love her, like this thought went through my mind. I'm supposed to love her no matter what I do. I can never leave this woman. And you fast forward 13 years and I'll tell you what's scary is not loving someone unconditionally. It's not. What's far more terrifying is opening yourself up to be loved unconditionally. When I know there's nothing I can do that will make this woman leave me, and I, I have not always been as perfect as I am standing before you today. <laughs> we went through some stuff, right? We went through some, some stuff. And I realized no matter what I do or what I say or try to drive her away, she simply will not leave me. And that does not compare to God's love for me or God's love for you. No matter what you do, curse God. Yell at God, scream at God, run from God. No matter what you do, he will not stop loving you. And that kind of love makes you want to change. I want to be different. God, I don't want to look at that anymore. I don't want to laugh at that anymore. I don't want to watch those things anymore. I don't want to spend my money on that anymore. I want to treat people different. I want to love different. I want to be different. God's unconditional love, if you allow him to enter into the darkest spaces of your heart, will transform you. And God says, this is the new standard I want you to live by. Christians, we have to ask ourselves, is what I'm thinking, what I'm saying, what I'm buying, what I'm doing, does this please God or does it please the world? He said, I use my body and my time and my resources and my job and my career and my home. Does it bring honor to God? Am I holding fast to what is good? Or am I holding fast to what is evil? We have to ask ourselves this. We have to ask ourselves, are we living by God's grace and through God's grace, by the new standards that God sets? If you, if you don't believe me, there's new standards. Read Romans 6, read Galatians 5, read Ephesians 5, read Colossians 3. There's a new standard God has called us to live, not in order that he would love us. Listen, I'm gonna tell you this a hundred times, not so that God would love you. He already loves you. Because he loves you, live different. Because he loves you, live different. What if, what if our resolution in 2021 wasn't to do loving things, but to become loving people? Why are we doing this series? Because I would contend that what this city needs and what your homes need and what your church needs and what your cities need and what your neighborhood needs, what your school needs, what your place of work needs, are people who love God, love Jesus, and express the genuine love of God. The kind of people who are anchored in the gospel of Jesus, whose identity is anchored in the cross of Christ, who have, who have experienced the genuine love of Jesus and now express it without hypocrisy, running from what is evil and turning and holding fast to what is good. This is who I believe God has called us to be. There is a richness in this life that God is inviting you into. And, and I look at this and I, and I think to myself, I do, I think to myself, God, how in the world could I become like that? How, how could I become like that? Because I know me, I, I'm selfish and I can manipulate to the, with the best of them. I can control with the best of them. I have, if you haven't noticed, I have the gift of talking. I can talk. I can talk you into anything. I can talk you out of anything. I can talk. How do I do this? When I, when, God, I, I know how deeply flawed I am. How, how do I do this when, when I'm distracted? 
How do you know? You're distracted by You got to wake up tomorrow and you got to go to work. And you got kids who need stuff. You got bills that have to be paid. You, you, have, you have weddings to be planned. You have, you have dates to go on. You have a career to build. How do we actually do all this? How do we do this when we're tempted to turn to our own ways? Here, how about this? How do we do this? And this is the story of many of you. You're like, yeah, pastor, this all sounds good. Let's be loving. Church is loving. Well, let me tell you my story of how the church, the ones who are supposed to be loving, hurt me the most. I mean, we could probably do, we could probably write a book of all the people here with church hurt. Everyone watching. And, and I would love to think, I would love to think, not here, not here. Now, we, we love better than anybody here. We've never hurt anyone here. But then this week when I opened my email and I get a really long email of someone in this body of believers unpacking to me how much I grieved them and hurt them. Now, instinctively, I want to say, yeah, but you don't know what happened. You don't know the situation. And I can feel the Spirit of God telling me this person is deeply broken and hurt because of you. Regardless if you meant it or not, people are hurt. And so I didn't fire up my computer and like, oh, well, let me tell you how you've hurt me. Is that what we'd love to do? Like, well, let me tell you. It's just deeply grieved. It's deeply grieved. Like, God, I can't believe, I, I can't believe. Lord, this person is hurt because of me. So how do I make this right? How do I confess and repent and tell her that, that, I, that I'm deeply flawed and deeply hurt and, and, and I validate her pain? I don't excuse any of it. How do I do that? I can only do that if I remember one thing. See, all of this, Romans 12, all of it begins in verse one. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. I appeal to you by the mercy of God, love in a way that's genuine. It always goes back to the cross. The cross is how we see the world because when I look at the cross, I see Jesus who ran from evil. He pushed against evil and he held on to all that was good. And on that cross, he gives me and you a beautiful exchange. He takes all of your sin and all of your unrighteousness and all of your unforgiveness and all of your bitterness and all of your unwillingness to love. He takes all of it, he crucifies it. The Bible says he condemns it in the flesh. He condemns it in the flesh and he transfers to you what is beautiful and blameless and spotless and holy and good and genuine and righteous you hold fast to the cross of Christ. That's how we become a people who are loving. And my prayer, my prayer for this church is that when people walk through these doors and hundreds and thousands will walk through this door. Before the pandemic, we were on a collision course to just crazy explosion growth. But my prayer is that whoever walks in this door doesn't leave saying, man, that preacher is so good. Man, that worship is so good. I pray they would leave saying, I have never felt more loved in my life. I pray our reputation in Denver and the world is a bunch of people who look different and talk different and act different and vote different, but man, they know how to love people like Jesus. That's my prayer for our church that we become the most radically loving people this city has ever seen. And when we do, not if, and when we do, we will see a revival awakening in our city like you have never seen before. Let's pray for that day.